Cooper. Thanks for picking my talk in this time slot. I know we had a lot of choices today. Uh, so I went, went ahead with the one hour talk recommendation that Mike had sent out, uh, but I still have 129 slides to go through, so let's get started. Uh, so who am I? Um, I write cookbooks. Enough said. Uh, I also work in web operations. I've worked for IBM. Uh, I worked in e-business, I did all the enterprise e business, Java and XML and all that stuff, I managing systems at IBM. Then I managed systems at SANS where I automated infrastructure with Puppet, Capistrano, and, and a bunch of other <coughs> internal tools. And then that brought me to HJK Solutions, who did systems administration consulting for startups. We did a lot of work with uh, Puppet and Capistrano and Ruby on Rails startups and that sort of thing. So HJK Solutions became Opscode when we published Chef, and uh, currently I do, I write lots of cookbooks, and I also do our training program and our consulting services, and I also do evangelism, talking at conferences, and, and that's like, that kind of thing. So who are you? So who's a developer? Like everybody, right, okay. So who's a systems administrator? Who's actually a systems administrator who Who's a developer who does systems administration? And who wants to get rid of their systems administration work? Yeah. All right, yeah. Right. Chef will help you with that. Who's, who are business people? Hey, if you're an independent consultant, you are a business people. So we now have a logo for Chef. That's kind of cool. So we can stop using like you know the Chef from the Muppets, <laughs> Chef from South Park is my uh, So let's have a show of hands uh, again. Who's using Chef Solo? Few people through engine yard or on your own. Yeah. Uh, who's using the Chef server? Who's using the Opscode platform as your Chef server? We love you. Thank you. Um, and we really love everyone. And uh, I'll hand out hugs afterwards. So if you're not familiar with Chef, it enables infrastructure as code, which is hard to read since it's dark gray up there. Um, but this isn't a talk on how Chef works or any of that nitty gritty. I've got a heap of talks and training classes. Uh, basically, we don't have time for that in 30 minutes. So, uh, if you do have any of those questions, direct them to any of those resources. Uh, or if you scream on Twitter angrily, I will probably respond to you and say, hey, how, how can I help you? So, Chef itself provides an MDC framework. That's pretty cool. So, how does it do that? So, the node attributes of the model, information about the system we're configuring, is the data that we're going to do something with and we're going to roll it in some way. The configured node is the view, and the recipes are the control. And since Chef recipes are just Ruby, it gives us a lot of power and flexibility. And since Ruby is a programming language, we want to be able to do things properly and design them well, because we're going to put those recipes into what we call cookbooks, which are packages of recipes and supporting code. So these. These cookbooks have applicable design patterns. Now, I'm not a computer scientist, so if you are and I'm misusing design patterns, I apologize. Uh, and we can have that discussion at the Hackfest, and that would be, be pretty cool. But these cookbooks represent best practices. And so when you apply good design patterns, and then you build these into best practices, those cookbooks can be used by other people. But when it comes to best practices, there are opinions. There's opinionated software out there where everybody knows and loves, and there's a lot of best practices encoded into the way that people build and manage systems. So it's a good idea to, to get those opinions out there and to share them with the world so that they can tell you how wrong you are on an internet forum and you, know, you can call them a troll. No, you're a troll. No, you're a foul. So we're going to talk about cookbooks. Uh, well, maybe not those cookbooks. Maybe the off-code cookbooks. Uh, we've got a lot of cookbook a lot of uh, branches and forks in the cookbook network. Who's for the cookbooks repository? There's only like four people here out of the 300. Okay. Um, who's contributed a patch to the cookbook project? Anyone? No? All right, I don't want to ask the next question. Um, the, next, actually, the next question is if, if you had, and, and I told you to sign a contributor license agreement, that's because we chose the Apache license. and. We wrote a blog post about it, and the important part is uh, that we're not going to uh, relicense your contributions. It's that you get to keep those. We just redistribute them for you. So, contributor uh, <coughs> license agreements, yay. But you can also have your code reach a lot of other people through our community <coughs> site. We 
we really appreciate our community and we want, we want to provide a, a place for people to be able to share chef code and cookbooks and be able to uh, make uh, ratings and, and you know have, have this whole social networking thing going on. This is the newly redesigned cookbook site, so you can share it there. You don't need a CLA. To, you don't even need to license your stuff attached. Though if you do post things on here, make sure that you have the rights to redistribute it, because if you put re non-redistributable code in a cookbook, and somebody says, hey, off code, uh, I'm going to the DMCA, then it will say, okay, uh, I'm going to take it down. So make sure that you can distribute the code that you're distributing, and if it's cookbooks you're writing yourself, you, know, you also want to follow a good design pattern so that people give you lots of really awesome stars. <coughs> so these cookbooks package up the configuration, and they have a whole bunch of stuff in them besides just recipes. So let's talk about this stuff. The first thing here, uh, who saw this blog post by Tom Carson Warner from, uh, from GitHub? So he wrote this blog post on readme-driven development, and it talks about how you, the first thing you should do with a brand new project is write the readme. It helps you get clarity about the code that you're about to write, and it helps you basically do some brief documentation about it. So really, write the manual, because your users of your cookbook will appreciate that. So after you've written the, re the manual, it's time to write some recipes. So let's go through a nice contrived example. This year I went to FOSDEM, which is a large conference in Europe. Has anybody heard of it? A few people? Has anybody gone? Nobody? Okay. Um, there's like 5,000 people there. It's the largest open source convention in the world. And there's like 300 talks in two days. It's kind of intense. Uh, the talks are split up into these different dev rooms, and one of them was the GNU dev room. And I attended a talk on GNU Parallel, which is pretty cool. It replaces XRs and allows you to run a bunch of, type, type in a bunch of tasks to Parallel, and it'll just spawn them out. And so for our remaining uh, 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you all about GNU Parallel. Uh, actually, I'm going to tell you about how I wrote a cookbook during the talk. But that's not because I'm awesome. Cats with laser eyes are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's also not because the talk was boring. I actually wanted to write that cookbook anyway. So it's like just about any kind of GNU software. You w get a tarball, you untar it, you go into the directory, and you configure, make, make, install. Uh, or you do a brew install parallel. Uh, and then you rejoice when you're done. But it's not packaged by any of the major Linux distributions, so I want to do that in a recipe. So we've got two resources, a remote file that W gets that tarball, and a bash script that does the untar and building it. So that's not hard, but it's a pretty bad recipe. And it's not bad because it installs it from source, unless you're a Unix sysadmin with a beard and a package of it. <laughs> so really, why is it bad? Uh, it, the remote file resource itself has some problems. Uh, it, uh, you, you can't download from a different location. The source is the GNU.org. What if I want to mirror that on my internal repository, you know, my internal server, and distribute it from there? Or what if I want to download a different version? That was a version that was current that day, but I'm sure that it, since it's active to develop, another version's come out since then. And the other thing is that the way that the Chef remote file resource works is it will download that file every single time to a temporary location, compare the checksum to see if the target in slash TMP matches the, uh, the checksum. So we're going to use some customizable attributes. So design, design pattern one, use attributes. So in our cookbooks attributes default.rb file, we can define some same defaults. So I can say, here's the URL where GNU Parallel will be from. Here's the version to use, and uh, SHA-256 checksums don't fit on slides. <coughs> also, the slash TMP isn't a great location because some systems clear it on reboot. Not that you ever reboot your servers, or your development workstation, or wherever else. But that would cause the file to be downloaded again. And we can use an internal shell configuration value called file cache path, which is kind of hard to read, sorry. Uh, it, that's file underscore cache underscore path. Uh, we can use that to download it to a temporary, kind of temporary cache location uh, that Chef uses internally. So design pattern two, <coughs> exploit Chef internal values. So now we can rewrite our recipe for remote file using attributes and the internal values. 
So there's a little more, uh, a little more Ruby going on in there. We've got some string expansion and some attributes with hashes, and that kind of scares, that scares this guy. But he'll get over it. The bash script has some problems because, uh, you know, least of all is that it's compiling from source. <laughs> Uh, the version needs to be an attribute, so we're going to reuse that. We can also, uh, we might want to modify the way that the configure options are running. So we might want to have some configure options. So we're going to use more attributes. So we're going to set up a default value for the configure attributes as an empty array, and then that same default can be easily changed by the user by modifying that attribute within their, within their environment. So then we can have a little bit more uh, cool stuff with the configure options. So we're going to join that array, and then we'll just pop that right there on the configure command, and off we go. And this guy is a little less scared because the readme says that we're going to do this, and he now knows how he can modify that. Of course, he's going to make a package anyway, depending on the platform that he's using. So in an attributes file, we can select a, a platform based on the node platform value and it shout that's automatically detected when it, when it runs. And so this guy likes to use CentOS, and so he's, going to, he's created a package, he's hosted it in his internal repository, and he's going to have a, uh, he's going to select the package value for that attribute when it's on CentOS. Otherwise, it's going to use the source installation method. Then the GNU parallel cookbook that we've written has a recipe that will include a recipe based on the attribute. So we'll just put that package or, or source will, will be a recipe that will just get inserted there for the recipe inclusion. And then we have our package recipe that just says package, can do parallel, and off we go. So yeah, the numbering of design pattern things, I, I lost track very quickly. Uh, <laughs> somebody mentioned the attention deficit disorder. I can't even say it. So uh, I just, you know, arbitrary number. So, the main thing is to use platform-specific conditionals so you can make your recipes and cookbooks usable on multiple platforms. Because everybody runs Ubuntu. <laughs> Who doesn't run Ubuntu? Who's using an NGDR Cloud? If you use an NGDR Cloud, you're not running Ubuntu. It's uh, Gen 2, I believe. Uh, and somebody from NGDR can correct me if I'm wrong. But, but not, not, apparently not for long. But anyway. Uh, so we've done all that, we've set up this cookbook, and now we can run Chef, and we can get the remote file, and we can set the mode on that file, and then we can run the script builds to do parallel. And I wrote all that in about 30 minutes, because I really am a cat with laser eyes. So here's a giant rubber duck, and we'll talk about recipes a little bit. So we like to split up recipes by functionality. Generally, when you're building Chef cookbooks, you'll have a cookbook per type of service in your environment. So later this afternoon, we'll hear more about service-oriented architecture and how that stuff kind of take, takes a play in the way you build applications, I guess. Uh, it's a good idea to split things up, it makes it more modular. And so when we write cookbooks, we have a cookbook per thing that we're configuring. So we have a Navios cookbook, we have an Apache cookbook, we have a MySQL cookbook. But with each, with each one of those, we have separate recipes based on the default thing that that cookbook should do. Like, the default Apache cookbook should install Apache, because that's kind of reasonable. The default client cookbook for MySQL should set up a system to be able to connect to a MySQL server. And then, of course, the MySQL server cookbook would be setting up the actual server that's going to run your database. Uh, each of these recipes, uh, as we've seen, should avoid hard-coding data. Besides node attributes, Chef has some other rich features for not hard-coding data and being able to express information about your infrastructure in arbitrary and cool ways. One of those ways is data bags. It's a server-side feature where the server stores some arbitrary data about something that you have written a JSON file out there, and it will just make that available to be used in recipes. Uh, and then Chef, the Chef, one of the key features of the Chef server is that it has a rich search API using Solar, and you can detect all these node attributes data and some other stuff. So combining all these different ways to dynamically build configuration gives us the ability to have code reuse where we can publish cookbooks that dynamically build data and discover things about the infrastructure, and then we can share that with other people, and then they can populate their Chef server or their Chef Solo attributes with 
whatever data is required to build the recipes. Because you did write a readme file that says what attributes you're going to use, right? So, uh, all that said, design pattern four is separate recipes. So we're going to look at it at a, another contrived example where I'm going to switch over to our Navios example, uh, where we're going to have a few recipes. So we have a default recipe, which is what we generally use to install the common components for a particular uh, thing. So Navios has some common stuff that will be installed in clients or servers. Then we've got some client setup. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to use the chef server search to search for who the server is and Nagios clients will be able to allow that server to connect and do monitoring. And then the server itself will do a search for all the clients. So all the nodes that have checked in, it's going to monitor all those nodes and we can dynamically add new nodes and as they save their data, then they become discoverable uh, with, the, with the server. So Nagios, basically we're going to install some packages and create a plugins directory that's got some various Nagios plugins. Now a little danger here. Some, a lot of people were using Chef Solo. These, some of these features are uh, only available in Chef Server. And this is the, one of the differentiating reasons to use the servers to enable the ability to do this kind of search and this uh, central storage of your uh, infrastructure data. So here's the part of the client recipe. And the important part here, and that red doesn't show up, but at the top we've got a search we're going to search for the node that has a particular role, and then we're going to add that, that node's IP address to this monhost value. And then we're going to pass monhost into a template that's going to render out a config file that has the appropriate value set up. And the, the, the Nagios client, uh, NRPE, would then have the monitoring server be able to connect and run NRPE and do monitoring checks. Then, in our server recipe, we are going to search, the second line up there is going to search for all the nodes uh, that have a host name, and we're going to put those nodes into a host config file, and then any new system that's added to the Chef server will then also automatically get monitored by the Nagos server. So this makes it very easy to be able to implement your, uh, somebody else's cookbook that can use the search feature, and you can run that in your, in your environment, build audio servers that automatically and dynamically build uh, configurations. But I use Chef Solo, you say. Well, sorry, but the server does give you the persistent node data, the arbitrary infrastructure data, the data bags, the search indexes, and finally, an API. So if those are compelling reasons for you, and you want, still want to use Chef Solo, you can check for Chef Solo, or somebody else can check for Chef Solo using an internal Chef configuration value. So I can see if we have Chef config solo, and if so, then if it's solo, then we're going to have a node attribute that says, here's the node list for uh, some attribute that's my thing is going to have a node list. Otherwise, we're going to search for the node list based on the role name my thing. And that's arbitrary. You could, you could put that in to your recipes in any way that makes sense for however it is you're deploying uh, that recipe. So hard coding data is an anti-pattern. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the key things about uh, sharing customizable cookbooks with other, other people. Uh, we, like to, we, we encourage people to document the default attributes and populate the readme file that describes how that's put together. We use roles heavily within the Chef community and within the way that we write cookbooks. So let users override those attribute values based on the presence of that attribute in the role. And we can also abstract some of that stuff out to the data bags and play nicely with Chef Solo. So next, uh, we're going to talk about some templates and files. These are the static assets, you can, or the assets you can drop off by Chef and have them configure config files or drop off tarballs and that sort of thing. They follow file specificity, and the reason for this is primarily to give us platform-specific config files. So, for example, MySQL has a different has different uh, config options based on its version, and every single platform has slightly different versions of MySQL as packaged by default. So you can split it up based on platform or even specific versions that might have changed the config file. So you just drop that in there, and when Chef runs, it will use the file specificity to pick the appropriate 
version of that template. So that helps you be able to write a cookbook that people can use on other platforms. Then we've got static versus dynamic resources. The cookbook file is static. There's no dynamic build in building of the config files, and the templates are ERB, and they just get dropped off with whatever values get generated and processed by ERB. You, of course, want the template to be there because it's easily shareable, gives you a better way to do data-driven configuration, and you can use these various data sources, uh, such as data bags, node attributes, and search. There's a bunch of other stuff that goes into cookbooks. Uh, some of this is more advanced topics, but uh, know that it gives you a lot more flexibility in what you can use to build your infrastructure. So we'll take a look at, at these briefly. Uh, first is libraries. So libraries can give you recipe helpers, library resource and provider helpers, and new heavyweight resource and providers. So if Chef doesn't have a resource for managing something you want to manage, such as a React cluster, you can write a React cluster uh, heavyweight resource and provider and do all kinds of Ruby code in those to be able to build out that particular kind of resource. The recipe helpers uh, use the Chef Recipe class. The methods are available directly in recipes. And for example, in the library, we'd have chef, uh, class Chef Recipe, and then a method definition, and this one, Radiant Edge, we just determined uh, based on, it would just return the value of that attribute. And then in the recipe, we could just use if radiant edge, then we're going to use this deploy resource, else we could do something else. Uh, library resource providers help you not repeat yourself and abstract API calls. Uh, we have a cookbook called AWS that will manage EBS and Elastic IP resources on AWS nodes. Uh, right now, it uses write AWS, and at some point soon, it will be converted to FOB. Because uh, Fog is even more flexible and, and better syntax. And Weston will play all that in a little bit. Uh, but we can use we can use that uh, library use a library in in our cookbook to create a connection to EC2, and then we can use that within the library resource provider in order to operate on the EC2 API directly. We can also use heavyweight resources and providers. These are the full Ruby classes, like those that are found in Chef itself. They, allow, they also allow some behaviors that are not allowed in the lightweight resources and providers, such as inheriting and extending existing resources and providers. So if you wanted to have, say, a remote file that's retrieved from an S3 bucket, the, there isn't a provider in Chef to do that, but you could write that into a cookbook resource in a library. And then you can also distribute those as gems such as Chef Deploy, as was published by NGR. So definitions, uh, don't use definitions anymore, uh, because they look like resources, but they're actually replaced by the resources they contain. And they, they're not as uh, flexible, and they don't behave the same, quite the same way. So instead, we encourage people to use lightweight resources and providers. This is a DSL for creating new resources and providers inside your cookbooks. And they really just contain, the resources contain two things, actions and attributes, and those attributes can have validation parameters. Don't, don't confuse these attributes with the node attributes, context is important, and naming is really difficult. So there's a bunch of validation parameters, you can go to the wiki page on this to read more about it. Uh, I've got a bit.ly link there, and I'm going to go to the slide, so you, uh, these slides will be posted, so you'll be able to get that. Uh, so this is an example resource. Uh, an example of the resource DSL. We have a list of actions. This one just has one action. And then we've got a bunch of parameters that can be passed in, like the host, the user, the password, the database. So we can create a database using a chef resource. Then the, then the resources are going to need providers. And the library provider DSL defines the action methods. And the chef recipe DSL is extended into these providers, so you can use regular chef resources in the action methods to shortcut things like being able to build templates. So the provider action code, uh, this is pretty good. It's going to use an execute resource to run a command to create a database. And this one's even better because it uses pure Ruby to talk to the database directly, with a, presumably with a library we connected the database with. And so design pattern 47 is to use more Ruby. The 
reason, the provider needs to be identified so we don't try and create the database over and over and over and over again. So we have a method in providers called load curve resource. We can use that to determine if the database already exists. And then we can use that in a recipe to create a MySQL database that's just going to set up the database for my application. Now, a word about metadata. Cookbook metadata defines stuff about the, data, about the cookbook. One of the important things here is that we have a dependency that de declares another cookbook that we need to have in, in, uh, in order to use this cookbook. So in the GNU parallel, we're going to build from source, so we need build essential. Build essential installs compiler tools, so we need to have that installed. And we'll use include recipe. And if we're going to use any other cookbooks, libraries, library resource providers, templates, or anything else from other cookbooks, you need to declare a dependency on it in the metadata. If you're using Chef Solo, the metadata is not required because you have to ship all the cookbooks anyway because there's no server to distribute them. Uh, and so uh, I'm getting close on time, so I'm going to go through testing cookbooks really quick. The, uh, I'm not talking about BDD and TDD of cookbooks. They are Ruby, so you can use your favorite test framework to do that. But what I'm talking about is uploading the cookbook to the server or sending the tarball over and running with Chef Solo and then using Vagrant or Night PC2 server create or whatever you like, just as long as you run Chef Client or Chef Solo on the system to test that the recipes actually did what they're, that they're supposed to do. So it's important to show your work. We're a community, we're open source, we want to share these with other people. That's the whole point of putting the effort into making it usable by others. So you can get pushed to your favorite GitHub repository, or you can go the extra step and use uh, Knife to communicate with the OSPO community site to share with others and then the cookbook would be available for others to use. These are some of the cookbook examples that are on the site. We have a shortened URL, ckbk.it slash name. will go to that particular cookbook so it's easy to use in Twitter, and that sort of thing. Uh, and it doesn't look like we have time for questions, but I will be at the Engineer Hack Fest tonight. If you have any questions about Chef or any of this, let me know. And we've got an abundance of resources and space robots. Thank you.